Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. My name is Mari, and I am an alcoholic. And I am so grateful to be here and grateful to be sober. My dry date is the 10th of August, 1984. My group is the Markham Third Tradition Group in Markham, Ontario. I have a sponsor. She has a sponsor. And I'm a grateful member of Alcoholics Anonymous. Thank you so much, uh, Jimmy and Mary Beth and Jen and the committee for putting this on. A gathering of alcoholics celebrating the great miracle of recovery. I'm so grateful to be here. And uh, I would like to thank Peggy and Mike for picking me up to, um, yesterday. And uh, I would like to thank our speaker last night, Liz. You did a great job, Liz. And uh, <laughs> and Cliff and Laurie today for that wonderful, wonderful workshop you put on. Thank you. And I would like to thank Butch so much. You know, everybody thinks Butch is wonderful. (laughs) Well, I live beside Butch almost. Well, quite a bit away, right? And he is wonderful. But let me tell you what happened yesterday. (laughs) Yesterday, Yesterday morning, we're both at the airport checking in for the same flight. And he's in group one. And I'm in group two. And he said to me, come with me. Come on, group one. So I go up beside him, and then he runs away and leaves me. (laughs) After he checks in. And I'm explaining to her, he told me to come. (laughs) I love you, Butch. Great talk. Great talk. Thank you. So, uh, yeah. So, uh, step one admitted we are powerless over alcohol and that our lives had become unmanageable. You know, today we were at Dr. Silkworth's gravesite, and I'm standing there with such deep gratitude. And Jimmy and some other members were reading out about how Dr. Silkworth dedicated his life for us. And I was thinking about Dr. Silkworth lying under the ground and the great legacy he left to us. And I asked Jimmy, did he have kids? And Jimmy said, no, he didn't have any children. And uh, I was thinking, well, old as I am and all of us here, we're all your kids. Because if it wasn't for you, we wouldn't be here. And if it wasn't for the, we, I was talking with Billy today about William James and Carl Young and everybody that eventually gave us this wonderful program. You see, I am one of those absolutely hopeless alcoholics. I'm standing there today in the sun with 38 years of recovery by the grace of God and everybody that's gone before me and I was thinking 1980 I was living on the street at the bottom of Lincoln Road on Miami Beach. My entire life burned to the ground because of an innocuous little fluid called alcohol that I used to see other people drink with impunity. And I was absolutely baffled. What happened to me? What happened to my life? Where are my children? I've lost my children. Where is my life? How could this happen to me? You know, people used to say to me, Mary, why don't you just have one? You see, I did not know about the phenomenon of craving. I just thought I was different. So I would have one. And then I couldn't stop. 
And then people would say to me, don't you have any willpower? You ever try willpower in a case of diarrhea? (laughs) It doesn't work. (laughs) And here's what happened to me. My family came and dug me off the street. And I ended up back in Canada. And I ended up married one more time. I love getting married. (laughs) I just don't have any follow through. (laughs) I fall in love and then him and I are like Velcro. And we get married, and after about three weeks, (laughs) I can hear him breathing three doors down. (laughs) And you're laughing because you identify. (laughs) And then after four years in and out the mental institutions, being treated as a manic depressive, I love being institutionalized. I institutionalize well. (laughs) Because they give me all the lovely (laughs) yum-yums. The lithium, the valium, the librium, the (laughs) yum-yum-yum-yum. And then the last time I was in there, the doctors changed my diagnosis and called me a chronic alcoholic with an abnormal personality and told me I was a depressive. And the judge called me a tragic social circumstance. But you see, I couldn't tell the judge I'm powerless over alcohol. And also my life's unmanageable because I didn't have the language. But some wonderful people who used to take AA meetings into institutions like I was in When he declared me not a manic depressive, but a chronic alcoholic, he sent me to the AA meetings that they brought to the institution. And I listened to those people and something must have stuck. Something must have stuck. And one night I was drinking myself sober. You ever been there? What a nightmare. Because, you see, alcohol is my solution. So when this man came and 12-stepped me, he was a Native American. He was what we call in Canada, which a Meti, M-E-T-I, which means he's Native American French, as different from me as night and day. And he told me his story. And for the first time in my life at age 40, I was talking to someone who understood me. Because all my life, that's all I wanted. I wanted to be understood. And I said to him, Stan... I know I'm an alcoholic, but I'm nuts. I have a psychiatric report that says I'm nuts. He said, Mary, the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous is like 12 adjustable wrenches for any nut that comes through the door. (laughs) That's it. And I don't know what happened to me on the 10th of August, 1984, on the morning of my last drink, or the morning after I had had my last drink. All I know is that a little gal from Alcoholics Anonymous spent the night with me because I had a slip. And the next day she said, I'm going to leave you now because you're a loser. And I only stick with winners in Alcoholics Anonymous. But before I go, I'm going to ask you to kneel down and say the third step prayer. And I said to her, I kneel for nothing. 
And then something says, think of your children's eyes. And what I thought about was the previous Christmas I'd come out in the mental institution one more time, full of drugs, called Jamaica where my children were, arranged to go and see them for Christmas. They were so excited. And I got on the plane and I bought a bottle of vodka and I drank that until I reached Kingston, Jamaica. And when I got off the plane, my children are shouting, Mommy, Mommy. And this alcoholic mother drops down drunk in front of them. And they were led away and I'm lying on the ground. And my children are looking over their shoulder at me with the eyes of the child of the alcoholic. The broken promises and broken dreams one more time. And that's what I thought about on the 10th of August, 1984, when I finally surrendered. I don't know what happened. But since the 10th of August, 1984, and that girl spending the time with me, another AA person, I have not wanted a drink since the 10th of August, 1984. And I don't know why. I have no idea. You see, alcohol, I needed alcohol. Because the, the only normal living, as Dr. Silkworth talks about in the big book, that you get from drinking, for alcoholics of my type, was four years. From I drank at 25, and at 29 I was a full-blown alcoholic. Because, you see, from I was born, I felt different. All my life I felt different. I felt less than. I felt as if I was on the outside looking in. I never felt like I belonged. I had an unbearable, unshedable burden of self-consciousness, a self-consciousness that everywhere I went, I thought people were looking at me and judging me and finding me wanting. So you see, I had when I read Bill's story, I identified... And I went on to read a little bit more about Bill's history, and he talks about having an obsession with death. And I had an obsession with death. He talks about having panic attacks long before he drank. I had panic attacks long before I drank. And this obsession with death was with me until I drank. In fact, it was so bad. You probably heard I'm not from Canada. Uh, Mary Beth wanted me to talk a little bit more Jersey, but I don't know how to do it. <laughs> you know, the obsessions of the mind I had before I drank, the only alcohol could quiet for a little while. My first date when I was 15... I was, I don't know if you like that in America, but when you go out with a boy in Scotland and after whatever you've gone to the movies or a dance at the end of a night, he wants a reward. <laughs> and I am with this guy and he's getting very passionate with me. And of course I'm not involved because I'm too busy. <laughs> I'm too busy thinking about myself. And at the height of his passion, I said to him, so what do you think about death? <laughs> and he said, I think you should go home now. <laughs> when I went to Jamaica to live and had my first son, I thought that would fix me. I had traveled the world for 25 years, trying everything possible to fit in, but I never wanted to drink because I'm Celtic, I'm Gaelic, and there's a lot of alcoholism, but no women alcoholic, I'm the only one. <laughs> so after that, my little boy was born, I was so filled with fear, and I didn't know what happened, and I went crazy and lost my mind. And somebody came and gave me a drink, and Jamaica has 151 proof rum. 
I don't know if it was two or three, 151 proof rum is very beautiful. <laughs> and what it did for me, I didn't understand until my sponsor, Clancy, God rest him, explained it to me. He said, Mary, for some of us, that when the mind has too many obsessions, long before we drink, when the mind is so conflicted, then what happens to people, some people, is they go into psychosis. He said, but what happened to you is somebody gave you alcohol and it induced in you chemical psychosis and it changed your perception of the world because I went from being absolutely feeling I was losing my mind to having two or three drinks. And what do I get? What Dr. Silkworth talks about. Ease and comfort. I know that every little thing's going to be all right. <laughs> I know that intuitively. And it was for four years. And then it all went to hell. And I left the marriage and took my children and took them halfway around the world on a journey with alcoholism and they never touched a drop. So I lost my children. My children were taken away from me when I went back to Jamaica, and rightly so, by their father. But you see, intellectually I can accept my situation, but emotionally I could not. I know that I'm a drunken mother. I never physically abused them. And I don't know why I can't stop drinking and look after my children, and I don't know why you're taking away my children just because of what's something I don't understand. And then I try and kill myself, and that doesn't work. This alcoholism is the worst illness in the world. That's all I ever had. Alcohol. They used to say to me in Jamaica, Mary, come try a little sense of me, oh, your man. Try a little ganja. Look how the liquor's making your eyes red. And I used to say, I don't want nothing that's going to screw up my brain. I'll stick to liquor. Thank you. <laughs> that was my solution. I'm an alcoholic. I'm a chronic alcoholic, and I don't understand until I come in here. Until I come in here and I read the language that we have. So you see, long before I drank, I always knew there was something seriously wrong with me because people were always saying to me, there's something seriously wrong with you. <laughs> But nobody ever said your solution is a drink. But it was. So when I come in here into the rooms of AA on the 10th of August, 1984, in Edmonton, Alberta, I had nothing. I was done. And they tell me I'm going to have to admit I'm powerless over alcohol. I... I did not even know that this was about, that alcohol gave me power. Because you see, alcohol gave me comfort and I wouldn't even be, know how to tell you that. I just know that, you see, I didn't want anything that was going to make me high. I was born on high alert. <laughs> I wanted something that was going to give me a little bit of shush. Just a little bit of shush, a little bit of peace, a little bit of ease and comfort. So they tell me I have alcoholism and it's a spiritual and moral bankruptcy. And I loved when Dr. Silkworth spoke about the fact that he knew alcoholics needed some kind of moral psychology, but he didn't know quite how to apply it because they didn't have the proper means. 
He said they have the synthetic methods, science versus religion. He didn't know. And that is why, as we heard today, when Jimmy was reading, it was an amazing thing that when Bill had this spiritual experience, Dr. Stoke was a medical man, did not discount it. To remember the horror, the shameless of living on the street, of being taken up and used and thrown away like an old piece of cloth, of the horror of alcoholism when you're hopeless. You come in here and you say, can I have what you have? And you tell me, you're one of us. That is the greatest gift. And it is an amazing thing to me that prior to 1935, chronic, hopeless alcoholics like me were doomed to die. And I live a day to day beyond my wildest dreams because I came in here and admitted I was powerless over alcohol even when I didn't know how to do it. I come in and you define my problem. And I am so grateful for the men and women around me in Edmonton, Alberta at the time. They helped me. And I did not know what to do with myself. And I used to walk around because I was so ashamed with my head held down. And the men used to say to me, lift your head up. I don't know, I'm getting... Some of them used to say, lift your head up, even if for the moment you cannot see. They didn't care about the degradation and the muck I had lived in. They only wanted me to get well from this horrible illness that nobody understands even today called alcoholism. See, my problem was a strange mental and emotional condition that even today they don't understand that alcohol seems to be the solution for. I am one of those people where it says there are those two who suffer from grave mental and emotional problems, but many of them do recover if they have the capacity to be honest. Wow. Wow. That's me. Strange mental and emotional conditions. What is that? It's a personality disorder. That is why the 12 steps is about changing the personality. Like it says in Appendix 2 of the big book, a personality change sufficient to bring about recovery from alcoholism. You know, it's very hard when you come in and you remember that once upon a time you had four wonderful years. I had four wonderful years in Jamaica when everything was good and life was good and I loved it. And then I start drinking and it's all gone to hell in a handbasket. And nobody wants me around anymore. Even Bob Marley, who was a great humanitarian, didn't like me. (laughs) Didn't like me because I was an alcoholic and it's against the religion. And yet, there is this horrendous thing inside of me that says, am I going to get this? Am I going to get this? What we alcoholics do for each other is kind, loving, time, listening, caring, sharing this strange thing called alcoholism and the recovery. That's why I'm here, because people took the time to spend with me. When I thought that nobody would ever, ever spend any time with me or look at me with anything but disdain, 
and yet they did. <laughs> a few years ago, I was back in uh, Alberta where I got sober, and I saw my first sponsor. I said, dear Carol, I don't understand that a lot of my sponsees are being 13-stepped. I was never 13-stepped. <laughs> she says, do you remember what you looked like when you came in? <laughs> She said, we used to take you to meetings in our shopping cart. <laughs> I, I, had, I had Jake leg. I don't know if you ever I hear about that today, but it's a horrible thing. Um, so, so step one is also about the second part. That my life's unmanageable. And you know, my life was always unmanageable. I always had trouble managing my life. I never felt as if... I felt everybody in the world seemed to have the answer and I didn't even know what the question was. I did not know what the solution was. It was baffling to me. Life. You know? I, you know, I used to love Braveheart. You know Braveheart? I used to imagine myself a female Braveheart. <laughs> Naked with blue paint, running across the highland, shouting, freedom, <laughs> right? I never wanted anybody to tell me what to do. I never wanted any rules. I always thought I was different, and I always thought that I was special, and I always thought that I was crazy. And to come in and say, okay, your life's going to get manageable. How will it get manageable? It will get manageable by going through the rest of the steps. It you said, get a big book, get a sponsor, get active. If you don't like what you hear, we'll gladly refund you your misery. And I had to come in and follow instruction because I believed that you had a solution and I wanted what you had. I wanted to look like the women I saw who looked so beautiful, so dignified, and they told me what they used to be like. And I believed them. And it was so much fun. When you're going through the first step with some other newcomers, it's a lot of fun. I remember when they used to take us newcomers all to a meeting on a Saturday morning called Shifters. And they used to have a front row, and I was shaking for about six months after I came in. And they used to put us in the front row, and they called it Shaker's Row. And we'd all sit and shake. <laughs> And we trade horror stories, you know. You know the horror stories? Did you sleep last night? No, I didn't sleep last night. I felt like killing myself. Me too. <laughs> so what did you do? Well, I had a couple of chocolate bars and called my sponsor. <laughs> Can you imagine going into work in the morning? How was your night last night? Well, I felt suicidal. <laughs> You know, we have a language in here. We have a, we have a melody in here. Nobody in the world understands us except another alcoholic. Alcoholics Anonymous is the greatest thing in the world. It is the greatest thing in the world. And I don't know why I never heard about it before. I don't know why I had to go where I went, but I only know this. If God, if God, and I believe God has, restored me to a condition of sane living, sobriety, then the only reason for that is that maybe one day there'll be somebody in these rooms who will listen to me and don't have to lose their children and who don't have to go where I went. I will tell you because of Alcoholics Anonymous, because of the sponsors I've had, because of the steps I've taken, my children came back to me after 13 years. And they are the most loving children anybody could have, my two sons. But that never looked possible to me when I came in through the doors and was doing step one. And some of that anxious apartness that I used to feel out there from when I was little, I began to feel it in the rooms here. 
but it was in my mind. It wasn't you, it was me. And that's why I think sponsorship is so important. Because I would go to my sponsor and I would tell her how I felt and she'd say, no, that's you. I need sometimes to get a reality check. And I had a wonderful sponsor back then. And I've had many wonderful sponsors since. And step two came to believe that a power greater than myself could restore me to sanity. How am I going to do that? I don't believe in God. I was brought up in a very strong Roman Catholic family. My father was a Franciscan monk. He left the monastery because he had some religious dispute. He went into the army. He was in World War II, and he was with my mother's two brothers who were killed in the war. And I was brought up in a home where even my granny had no anger. She had love of God and acceptance of God's will. That's all I was ever taught. And I just seemed to have an inability, as it said, to accept much on faith from I was young. I was always questioning the priests. I just did not have that faith that my forefathers had. And then after where I ended up and what I went through, I thought, how can there be a God? I never thought for a minute it was me that had taken myself away from God. And yet, way back in my mind, you know, if you read the Carl Jung, Bill Wilson uh, letters, Carl Jung says that what the alcoholic seeks at a low level, he has a thirst for a union with God. He drinks spirit, but it's the wrong spirit. Isn't that amazing? He said the formula for the alcoholic is spiritus contra spiritum, which in Latin is spirit against spirit. Way deep down inside of me, maybe there was always this longing. And I found it when I came here. So to come to believe that a power greater than myself could restore me to sanity, how did I do that? Well, my sponsor said to me, something happened on the 10th of August, 1984, and you haven't wanted a drink since. What happened? I said, I don't know. I knelt down, I said a prayer. I don't know. I have no idea. I said, but I don't know if it's going to keep working. She said, well, let's start simple. Every morning you get up, you kneel down, and you say, whoever's keeping Carol sober, keep me sober. And at night time, you kneel down and thank whoever's keeping, kept Carol sober, keeping you sober. And just keep going to a lot of means and just listening to people. And just say prayers even if you don't believe them. Fake it till you make it. She said, because you'll come, you'll come to and you'll come to believe. And you know, I share this story a lot because it, <laughs> it was the beginning of my journey into coming to believe that a power greater than myself could restore me to sanity because I needed something. One day I'm listening to this old woman talking. She's the most spiritual woman I ever heard. And she's saying things like, as a drunken woman, I never went to bed with an ugly man, but I sure woke up with a few. (laughs) She said, but I don't do it anymore because I am a lady in Alcoholics Anonymous. And I went to her and I said, Helen, who is this God you have? I'm looking for a God. And she said, Mary, my God's called Harold I said, Harold? She said, you know that prayer, Our Father who art in heaven, Harold be thy name. (laughs) So I would say, morning, Harold. Keep me sober today. (laughs) But you see, for someone like me, for someone like me, eventually, all I will believe is my experience. That's all I will believe until I progress on the spiritual journey. 
And I come, I come to, and I come to believe that something, this power greater than myself, because that was my problem. The power I used to get from alcohol doesn't work anymore. So now because I'm powerless, I need power. And where am I going to get the power? I'm going to start getting it in the second step. Came to believe that a power greater than myself could restore me to sanity. I used to say, God, I don't understand you. I have no idea. I don't know how you're doing this. I don't know how I'm not drinking. I don't know how you let me go that far. And there was anger in that. Because I'm conscious. And God, I don't know why you let my children suffer that much. But I'm grateful for where I'm at today. I thank you, God, for all that you've given me, for all that you've taken away, and for all that you have left me. God, give me what I need and take away what I don't. Because I don't know what's good for me. So, the experience I began to have was that a thought of a drink never crossed my mind. I never wanted a drink. However, the second step meant more to me than the insanity of drinking. Came to believe that a power greater than myself can restore me to sanity. There was always something wrong with my head. I was never right. The only thing that made me right was alcohol. So I sit in the rooms for a while and I begin to get a bit paranoid again. And I don't want medication because the old timers, and hey, I'm not a doctor, I'm just telling you my story. I had four years on every kind of medication. So I don't want medication. And the old timers, on my dry day, I told them to put, come and put all my medication down the toilet. And they did. And they said they would stay with me 24-7. And they did. They stayed with me in shifts. And they said, Mary, if you're not really manic, the highs will get lower and the lows will get higher. And they did. And they said, every time you think something's not right, come and talk to one of us or talk to your sponsor. And I did. Like, I was talking about Shaker's role. One day I'm sitting there and I see the guy next to me look, like, look up on the, the wall like this. And the guy next to him starts looking up. <laughs> and I look up and I see a big horse fly in the wall and I think, are we having a group psychosis? <laughs> yeah. and, and an old timer said, it's really there. <laughs> so you see, this is so much more than people know. Step two is an amazing step. Came to believe. Come, come to, come to believe. How do you come to believe? By your own experience. Putting away all that stuff that... Resign from the debating society is what I was told. Resign from the debating society and just accept. Accept that there's something greater than you. And I come to realize today the simplicity of that. against the complexity of what it does for us. Bill Wilson said once that Alcoholics Anonymous is a program of utter simplicity encased in a mystery because he didn't know what happened to him either. But it's your experience. If you want this thing like I wanted it with every fiber of my being, then I'm just going to do what I'm told. And when it says the problem centers in the mind rather than his body, yeah, I had it before. My problem centers in my mind. And you know, sometimes today, I am in absolute awe and I don't have the words to describe to you the peace I get from the crazy mind I used to have. Since I came into Alcoholics Anonymous, that part of the second step restored me to sanity. 
how it has worked for me is about five times in 38 years, just four or five times, I have felt I'm having a panic attack. Out of nowhere, because that's where they always came. They came from nowhere. And I say, God, 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 God. And it's gone. It's gone. Every now and then I'll be sitting on a plane and I'll suddenly think, I'm claustrophobic. The air's not good. I better get off. (laughs) And I pray, and it's gone. That's my experience. The consciousness of the presence of God has become the greatest fact of my life today because it works for me. It works. You know, way back in the day, long before I ever drank, I went into nursing. It was a bad career choice because I'm obsessed with death. (laughs) I don't like blood. And I don't like touching other people's skin. (laughs) That's when I was 17. At 21, I get a job with British Airways. It was BOAC then, out of London, England. I'm up in a plane with all these people. I don't like people. (laughs) I'm claustrophobic. And I have panic attacks. All of that before I drank. So yes, come to believe that power greater than me can restore me to sanity. I came to know that once upon a time, the idea that someday, somehow, I will enjoy and control my drinking was the great obsession of every abnormal drinker, that the persistence of that illusion was destroying me. The persistence of that illusion was leading me to insanity and death. We don't die easy, alcoholics. People used to come to me and say, Mary, if I if I drink again, I'll be I'll be dead. I said, You wish. (laughs) I have tried it and I've given it a hundred percent. You don't. I have given drinking myself to death one hundred percent. It doesn't work. So these steps, these great gifts we've been given, and that eventually coming to get the joy I have, the joy in living, the freedom in living. Do I ever think about what happened to me down there in 1980? When my life down there was like going through a sewer in a glass bottom boat? Am I ever reminded about any of the stuff? Yeah. Of course I am. And sometimes I go, "Ah." sometimes the pain is so visceral, still, after 38 years. And yet I just move on. Because I have been recovered from a hopeless condition of mind and body and degradation and humiliation. And also every year, when... My old aunts came and took me off the street in 1980. They came from Scotland and took me off the street. When they saw me, the only thing I could get on my feet was a plastic flip, was plastic flip-flops. And I had tied them on with string. And because of the heat and the dust, they had embedded themselves into my feet. And my aunts had to get them dug out my feet. And every year I go back to Scotland, one of them's gone now and one's still alive. The first thing she'll say to me is, how's your feet? (laughs) And the other thing she'll say to me is, has that AA found out what's wrong with you yet? So, the inferences in step two is that I'm not saying 
that I lack power and I need to acquire the willingness to come and come to believe. It's really simple. And yet people complicate it so much. If you be hopeless, if you be in despair, if you have been suffering from the bedevilments, if your whole life has been burned to the ground by that little fluid that even looks like this, that I see people going to liquor stores and buying and nothing happens to them. But if people like us, you see, Bill Wilson said we are a separate entity, and we are. And I would say to you, no matter how far down you've gone, if, you, if you're new here, I welcome you. And I say to you that the age of miracles is not past because I shouldn't be here. I should not have my two sons as loving as they are every day telling me how much they love them. I have five beautiful grandchildren that love me. They tell me they love me more than fresh vegetables. <laughs> I have a brother in Scotland that I'm now a sister to. I was back in Scotland for two months. Now, the people there are celebrating my 38th year, and they took me out and treated me well and bought me flowers and bought me dinner. My aunt says, I don't understand it, because you were always a waste of time. <laughs> she talks like that to me. <laughs> she said to me, we should have had you a psychiatrist when you were three. I said, last time you spoke to me, you said when I was 10. She said, I've been thinking about it. <laughs> so I'll just finish with this. Faith, faith alone will avail me nothing. The affirmative of the rest of the steps that you go on and do, and I'm sure we're going to hear about that. I'm looking forward to it. I'll just finish with uh, what Bill Wilson said. He said, Alcoholics Anonymous is not a success story. Rather, it is a chronicle of our colossal human failure, turned to usefulness by the divine alchemy of a loving God. And thank you so much. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.